Listening Fanfiction presents Someone to Lean On by One for Every Day. Based off the cartoon series Avatar, The Last Airbender by Nickelodeon. Narrated for you by Sierra Fees. Prince Zuko prefers fighting with his right side. It's not that he's weaker or less skilled with his left limbs, but he always shifts into a defensive mode whenever one of them gets his left side exposed, sending out strong blasts of fire to protect himself instead of attacking the other person. He could just be right-handed, or maybe firebending forms favor the right side as well, but either way, Sokka uses Zuko's slight hesitancy to land a quick blow to his ribs. He smiles in retaliation, his stupid ponytail whipping with the sharp movement of his head as it turns to meet Sokka's. Later, Sokka will remember the brief flicker of fear in Zuko's eyes when Sokka had made that particular jab. He looked as if he'd been caught off guard by his hit, though it was pretty predictable. Not for the first time, Sokka wonders about the origins of the nasty scar on the prince's face and how after all this time it could make him mess up like that. Whatever it was, Sokka's thankful it allowed him to make the boy who had been terrorizing them for months look so frightened. Zuko walks from the forest, briskly with an arm full of firewood. He's on edge, more so than usual, and he takes a shaky breath to steady himself. He recognizes the patterns in the earth enough to know he should be close to camp, but he feels the panic rising in his bones. His whole body itches to move into a defensive stance to prepare for the worst, but the wood he's holding prohibits him. If someone were to attack, there'd be a moment of vulnerability spent to drop the wood. Maybe if he were with the others, it wouldn't make a difference, but Zuko knows what damage Ozula can do with a few seconds and a hint of weakness. Something in him feels like he's being watched or that someone's coming, but the feeling is on his left. He can't see from that side and the muffled noises he sometimes picks up make no difference amidst the silent trees. No amount of training, of adapting to make up for his gaping blind spot can help out here where he can't prepare to bend or ready his swords or rely on others to make up for his deficiency. Zuko wants so badly to whip his head around and check, but the sun is long since set in the sky and if he turned and got disoriented, he might lose his sense of direction and his way back to the temple. With the moon and stars hidden in the thick labyrinth of branches overhead, he'd only have his vague memory of particular rocks and roots on this path to guide him. Again, he fights the urge to abandon the wood and just light a flame, but he can't come back empty-handed. The spirits answer his greatest fears and a foreign hand clamps onto Zuko's left shoulder, causing him to flinch back and stumble to the ground, wood falling out of his grip on its own accord. Whoa, Zuko, didn't mean to scare you there. Thought you would have heard me. Anyway, Aang's vegetarian menu didn't really satisfy my warrior appetites. So I came out here to catch some real dinner. Saga extends his free hand to him, the other grasping the leg of some dead animal swung over his shoulder. Zuko hastily gathers the fallen firewood and gets to his feet without Sokka's aid, though he cringes a little at the way Sokka has to awkwardly take his hand back. So what were you thinking about? You seem pretty out of it when I came up to you. Sokka's still on his left while they walk, and it's not helping to alleviate the rapid beating of Zuko's heart. He can hear him well enough if he turns his head a bit, but he still wishes it wasn't necessary. I was thinking about someone sneaking up on me. He snaps. Sokka only chuckles. Really? Dude, I mean, I can be stealthy when I want to, but I wasn't exactly quiet. You should really get your ears checked. Sokka says it with a smile, but it quickly fades when Zuko looks down instead of meeting his eyes with the usual glare. To his credit, Sokka recovers quickly and moves on to another subject, though Zuko doesn't miss the glance he gives to the scarred side of his face, probably just now noticing the faint fogginess in his eye. For his pride's sake, he pretends not to see through Sokka's cursory excuse of having a rock in his boot when he stops briefly, emerging on Zuko's right side when he catches up. After that night, Sokka always approaches from the right, Zuko knows he didn't say anything to the rest of the group because they still move around him freely. The incident in the woods was an exception to the many times Zuko has been able to swallow his panic and hide his flinches. So for now, Zuko thinks that Sokka is the only one who knows about his weak spot. 
He would berate himself for allowing it, but it's actually kind of nice. It's shocking to Zuko that someone could see him so vulnerable and not use it against him. Sokka accommodates him. He always calls out when he's getting near and never passes things to him from his left. When they spar, he either slightly exaggerates his movements so he'll catch them in time, or avoid swinging where Zuko's vision ends entirely. Zuko finds himself becoming comfortable around him, the way he hasn't been since Uncle, who probably always knew about the extent of his injuries. He didn't realize how much he missed being able to let his guard down a little. He still worries that the group hasn't accepted him or that he'll keep messing up, but at least fewer of his conversations begin with him quietly recovering from being startled. Saka concludes that Zuko's scarred eye and ear don't work very well. Now that he knows, it's hard to believe he didn't catch it before. The guy flinches a lot. He feels guilty for scaring him so badly that one night, but Zuko seems a lot more relieved around him after he started hanging around his right side. He keeps this up at Boiling Rock, walking next to him so that if he looked at Zuko, he'd only see unmarred skin, even without the helmet. This changes when Zuko's found out. The guard who spotted him yanks him roughly by the arm and calls out to Sokka for help while Zuko looks around distressed and Sokka suddenly feels an overwhelming surge of protectiveness over Zuko. They're not quite friends yet, but he's an ally, and if they get out of this alive, he'll probably be friends with Zuko for life, just out of gratitude. Either way, he knows about his blind spot, and he doesn't want some random guard moving around where Zuko can't protect himself. He doesn't want Zuko to feel scared. So he moves next to the guard and pretends he's patting them down for injuries, only so that he can shift into Zuko's vulnerable space and grab his arm in a way he hopes is gentle. From then on, he doesn't let anyone but himself on Zuko's left if he's around. He'd rather he be a bit uncomfortable with Saka's presence there than have him be exposed to someone who actually wants to hurt him. Those people are plentiful among the guards. Some look at their former prince with a distaste that makes Saka's stomach sick. By the time they're all safely on Azula's airship, he's exhausted. He musters up the energy to spend a couple hours catching up with his dad and Suki, waiting till the end of the night to approach Zuko from where he's leaning against the railing of the observer deck. For a moment, he debates going to his right, but that somehow feels wrong. Surprisingly, Zuko doesn't flinch. Saka wonders briefly if he just hasn't noticed him yet and that he's going to freak him out again, but then he turns his head slightly towards Saka. You know. Yeah! Thank you. Zuko shifts a bit closer, makes himself a bit more vulnerable. He doesn't say it up front, but the message is clear to Saka. I trust you. Zuko! Aang jumps down gracefully from Appa's back before toppling towards Zuko and sending both of them to the ground in a bone crushing hug. He hasn't seen his friends in close to a year, having parted ways a couple months after the war when they all left the Fire Nation. He's missed them all terribly, and though he's pretty sure Aang's greeting will leave a bruise, he much prefers it to the distance all his advisors and servants and everyone is then giving him. Uncle left for Ba Sing Se months ago, and Tai Li left with the Kyoshi warriors at the same time as the others, so for a while his only companion was Mai. He probably would have crumbled under the pressure of it all if not for her quiet company, but even then they didn't touch much. It was easy to let go of something you never really had. Losing her as a girlfriend didn't hurt so much once they figured out they only loved each other platonically and when they still had a strong friendship in the aftermath. He keeps her letters from her recent travels in the Earth Kingdom along with the ones from Uncle and his other friends, cherishing the words and the small comfort their written voices bring him. He even gets one from Toph along with a note from the scribe she hired. The letters mean a lot, but they don't compare to their faces in the flesh, bright with smiles directed at him. Their easy touches are like a breath of fresh air from the stifling formality he's grown accustomed to. He tries to memorize them all, cataloging the feeling away from when they leave again. Aang's bear hug, Katara's familiar embrace, and Suki's kiss on the cheek. He even hangs on to the punch he gets from top, but most of all, he relishes in soccer. 
He's the same height as Zuko now and broader in the shoulders. His laugh rings out a bit deeper than before, but it's all the same as he wraps his arms around Zuko. He keeps a splayed hand on his shoulder when they pull apart, immediately moving to Zuko's left. He can almost cry at the relief he feels. He didn't truly notice until the feeling was gone, but for months, Zuko has been dense with the stress of covering his blind spot on his own. He suspects that Suki figured it out when she oversaw him with her warriors right after Ozai was defeated, but they had to leave for Kiyoshi and he was left with the Fire Nation guards. He's comfortable enough with them, but they don't know about his impairments and he hates the way they move in and out of the limits of his vision. Even Mai would either catch him off guard or leave his weak side open, though he knows there's no way she could have known to do better. With Saka, he can finally relax, because not only is he aware of Zuko's lack of sight and hearing, he actively defends it! They walk through the halls, conversations carrying loud throughout the otherwise quiet palace. He can't see Saka or make out the words he's saying without straightening his good ear, but he's somehow all that Zuko notices. On your left! He has a second to register Saka's voice coming from behind him before he's there on his scarred side, waiting for Zuko to turn his head before he begins venting about how much he is not looking forward to the meeting they were about to attend. He places a hand on Zuko's elbow in a gentle gesture to guide him, the small contacts being a familiar thing between them. He keeps it there, even as they make their way to the council room, the staff and advisors having grown used to the easy friendship between the Fire Lord and the Southern Water Tribe Ambassador. Some older generals still scowl discreetly when Saka takes his seat. He doesn't rank high enough to be that close to the Fire Lord under what's traditionally customary, but he can't bring himself to worry about their displeasure when he's so secure under Saka's protective gaze. He sees the general long before Zuko does from his place across the courtyard. The man had called out to Zuko twice and gotten no response before he seemingly snapped, stomping bitterly as he makes his way over to the Fire Lord. Saka moves to his feet as well, wanting to get to Zuko before the general, but the man is already yelling right in his scarred ear and causing his boyfriend to recoil away violently. My lord! I am a wonder you want to thank me, but I will not tolerate this disrespect. I have addressed you multiple times and you have chosen to ignore me. I have served this nation since before you could call, and I will not allow you to belittle me like this. General Tazo, I apologize, I did not hear you. The general cuts him off with a scoff, but before he can raise his voice again, Saka takes Zuko's hand. General Tazo, if your observational skills are as good as you boast, I'm sure you must have noticed that... Zuko interrupts him this time, giving him a very blended look that Saka knows means, We'll talk about this later! I apologize again, General. I was very deep in thought. I meant no disrespect to you, and I will be more attentive in the future. Tasa seems pleased with that and turns to leave with a small bow. Zuko turns to face him with a stern look, but he quickly drops his gaze when he begins to speak. I don't want you telling people. You. If people knew, maybe stuff like this wouldn't happen. It's not anything to be ashamed of, please! Zuko, I don't like that people keep doing this to you when I'm not here! Zuko meets his eyes now determined. I'm not ashamed. Not anymore. I just... I only trust you with this, Sokka. Saka pulls him in for a hug, letting go of his hand so he can fit his arms around his waist. He doesn't think he'll be able to bite his tongue if another sleazy general raises his voice outside of the council room, but he's sure not going to break Zuko's trust. Zuko hates these types of events, but he's enjoying this particular one a bit more. It's hosted by an old Earth Kingdom family for some anniversary he can't remember, and the only people invited were very high-ranking nobles and leaders. This means that Zuko doesn't have to plan or worry about anything for the night except going about giving all his proper greetings and that he can delight in Saka freely. Ambassadors weren't included on the guest list, but Saka is at his side as always, only this time they accompany each other as fiancés. They normally don't show too much affection in public, even when their duties allow it, but tonight neither of them is showing much restraint. 
Saka's arm hasn't left his waist the entire evening, and they lean into each other heavily as they move throughout the hall. Some of the other guests definitely gawk at them, but Zuko drags him to the dance floor anyway, and they crash together sloppily. Saka winds his hands around his neck and leans in to kiss his cheek and the edge of his scar before dropping his head onto Zuko's shoulder with a drowsy smile, standing impossibly close to him as they sway, completely foregoing all etiquette and duty. Even so, Saka still angles his body slightly to cover Zuko's scarred side, always protecting it even while tired and tipsy. Sokka shakes with rage as he sprints to their chambers. There was another assassination attempt on Zuko, but no one had alerted him until after his meeting adjourned. The brief recount of the story did not help ease his mind in the slightest. It was only a single knife-clad pedestrian who had charged at Zuko while he was walking in Caldera, and his guards had stopped it before he could even touch Zuko. But Sokka still thinks that any attempt on Zuko's life take precedent! When he opens the door, he finds a familiar sight, but it still upsets him nonetheless. Zuko sits on the edge of their bed with his hair down and his chest bare except for his necklace. He looks shaken, as he always does after attempts, hands trembling slightly and his expression terror-stricken. For a second, he doesn't notice Sokka, but they both let out a shaky breath when their eyes meet, Sokka immediately moving to his side. Zuko holds on to Sokka's bicep with both of his arms and leans into his shoulder, hiding his good eye and ear in Sokka's chest. He realizes quickly that Zuko is slowly relying on him now, both his vision and hearing obscured by his scar and Sokka himself. It reminds him of when Toph would grip him similarly when she was separated from her element, Anapa's saddle or Katara's eyes. Oddly, Toph's fear had calmed him amongst the chaos, or at least brought him back to Earth. Sokka is very good at protecting people, to the point where he's almost anxious if he's only got himself to worry about. Having Zuko depend on him at this moment is the only thing that shakes off his fury. He can swallow his own panic and fear if it means comforting Zuko. That's not to say Zuko doesn't do the same for him. Tonight, Sokka will inevitably crack at the near loss of his husband, just like all the times before, and Zuko will curl around Sokka, will lull him to sleep with soothing reassurances, and then in the early hours of the morning, they'll make the exchange again, Zuko recovering from a nightmare of the day's events, and Sokka bracketing his own body around him. It's a familiar transaction, always taking care of the other, covering blind spots. Sokka's might not be literal, but Zuko knows he's still hesitant with the leg he broke as a teenager, and that he still struggles at public speaking, and that he sometimes overthinks things to the point of exhaustion, and Sokka also knows that Zuko will always be there to cover him. Zuko can barely remember a time when his left side felt vulnerable and unsafe. For years, it's only been occupied by Sokka, and for just as many years, Sokka has only come to mean home and safe. Sokka's his right-hand man, but he's always at Zuko's left. End of Someone to Lean On by One for Every Day. If you enjoyed this recording or the content, feel free to like a comment below or leave a review at the original story from the link in the descriptions. Thank you for listening and subscribe to the channel for more great content published every day.